Hello everyone, Jason Box here to talk about a science compilation of the short and long-term response of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets to climate change. This talk to be presented at the Danish National Climate Research Center today, 28 October 2024. I'm really presenting this review article where Hannah led this group of many experts to try to understand what are all of these extremes doing the, that we hear a lot about in the news, uh, rainfall on the summit of Greenland, uh, ice shelves breaking off, this kind of stuff. To put that short-term news into context of the long-term and does it matter, etc., so the article updates the mass loss changes. Our best measurements are from space, the gravity mission GRACE. And this graphic shows that most of the mass loss is coming from the southern ice sheet. And that's this curve here. There are extremes to bear in mind, uh, 2010, 2012, 2019. In these years, Greenland lost almost as much as both the average of Greenland and Antarctica is over the long term because of extreme events that I'll talk about. So overall, 255 billion tons per year average loss from Greenland. Now let's look at Antarctica. East Antarctica, it's in balance over this period. It was starting to get into decline but you can see this increase here because of additional snowfall and it's very noisy but it it's not part of the loss signal the losses in Antarctica are coming from the West Antarctic ice sheet here uh, this this red curve and then the overall is the green curve you can see it's all driven by West Antarctic ice sheet net because the Antarctic Peninsula is uh, well it's relatively small so this is the center of action so this number, 127, it's half as much as Greenland. It's half as much. Greenland is producing twice as much sea level contribution as Antarctica, even though Antarctica is much, much larger. Even the West Antarctic ice sheet is larger than Greenland. I produced this for Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program. And just to show, again, Greenland, Antarctica, uh, from the starting point, uh, Greenland's outpacing Antarctica. Antarctica is slightly outpaced Alaska. So the northern hemisphere is really where most of the sea level contribution is from glaciers. And so-called small glaciers, uh, they're, they're actually punching at almost the level of Greenland. And it's only when you include the uh, glaciers peripheral and partially contacted to the Greenland ice sheet that small glaciers are even uh, competing. Now Greenland, this, these are gravitation changes. So when you unload this part of the world by 166 gigatons per year, you actually have less gravity here, a small amount of less gravity. But the effect is that more of the sea level rise from Greenland loss will be in the southern hemisphere. Alaska, the same thing. You're unloading this part of the world and the global average is in the green curve. So you get these warmer colors, uh, it, essentially at the antipode of this place. So Antarctica here, Antarctic Peninsula and parts of West Antarctica, uh, they have their greatest sea level fingerprint in the north. So a place like Denmark should worry more about the Antarctic sea level contribution than the Greenland contribution in terms of just sea level rise. A earlier review uh, that the, our review article points to the long-term sea level change and uh, with two to three Celsius global warming, that what we're facing today is something akin to the Pliocene where there was six plus meters of sea level rise. Uh, so with the half degree global warming that we expect this century, we are firmly in this category of six plus meters 
of sea level rise and this question mark refers to how that sea level commitment can be up to 20 meters. Uh, so at this level of CO2, we have a committed sea level rise of 20 meters. That's like uh, 70 feet of sea level rise. Um, and so, you know, we're in for some trouble. It's going to take some time. The U.S. East Coast uh, shows uh, an abrupt increase. Uh, it's, not, it's sharper here than elsewhere in the world because of ocean circulation changes. Uh, you see the medieval warm period, the Little Ice Age. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed onto this graphic, where in our review article, uh, we go through all of the physical processes. So let me take you on this journey. Teleconnections. Think about El Nino, La Nina, and the one in the southern hemisphere that's related is called the Southern Annular Mode. The Southern Annular Mode, or the SAM, has been increasingly positive, which means stronger westerly winds. That's blowing uh, this away. And what that's doing is it's uh, pushing out the uh, sea ice. Uh, it's called Ekman transport when the winds like this and the net movement of the uh, the surface stress is 45 degrees in this direction. So it's diverging the sea ice outward. Um, the cause of the southern annular mode becoming more positive is thought to be ozone depletion, uh, which is intensifying the winds. So, um, and that too is pushing the sea ice outward. Um, the the effect of the stronger westerly winds is also producing a a warm water upwelling effect of the circumpolar deep water. Uh, all of that is uh, again is an Ekman transport, so-called Ekman transport, and you you diverge the water up here. It's it's pulling water upward, and this is undermining the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, Three quarters of the Antarctic ice sheet is surrounded by ice shelves. And this process is pumping warm water and that is uh, undermining the grounding line. So you have grounding line retreat as quickly as 50 meters per year, uh, per day, sorry. And so key parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet are retreating. Now, when they retreat down a so-called retrograde slope where the slope goes downward like this, there's no physical process that would slow that down. So that process has begun and for key sectors of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Ice shelves, uh, they're actually flat on the surface. Uh, ponds forming are uh, absorbing sunlight. Hydrofracture is the gravity pushing the water down. The water is heavier than ice hydrofracturing, uh, breaking up ice shelves. When that happens, the ice sheet flows out faster. And now we finally get to um, the the big scary part, which is with sea ice going out, more, more basal melting, so you have more fresh water capping the surface of the ocean here, preventing this warm water from radiating upward. Uh, that means the warm water ha has only to concentrate down here and get forced up under the ice sheet. So this uh, in self-enforcing feedback is uh, big trouble for the future of the ice sheet. Um, that's our understanding. Let me talk about Greenland uh, teleconnection, North Atlantic oscillation. It really expresses itself in, in uh, so-called blocking, which is uh, this anticyclonic circulation is, is like so. That is, um, this is West Greenland. It's pushing south air along West Greenland. South air is warm. It, it produces, say, more rain instead of snow. Um, the anticyclonic is also produces more clear sky conditions. So you get more absorption of sunlight that heats the uh, that, that enhances melt. Uh, you have a darkening effect. It's not well shown on this graphic. Um, that additional rain um, 
is absorbed in the, the sponge of the snow and it reduces the ability for the sponge to absorb snow when it refreezes, that enhances runoff. Um, so the, this, uh, so there's extra water. Um, the water is draining inward, infiltrating. It's getting to the bed um, and it's lubricating flow. So you have faster ice sheet flow. Uh, then the water, because fresh water is lighter, it rises quickly up the, the face, the underwater face of tidewater glaciers. There are not so many tidewater glaciers as Antarctica, but they're still uh, producing uh, iceberg calving, ice flow discharge that is almost uh, competing with the ice loss from uh, increased melting. Uh, so it's this competition of losing factors, uh, more runoff or more calving. Well, according to our assessment, um, the meltwater is uh, winning the competition with uh, iceberg calving, ice flow dynamics, and that will probably continue to be the case as Greenland's tidewater glaciers retreat out of the water. Um, <clears throat> Uh, snowfall uh, is increasing. For every degree of warming, you get 7% more snowfall. Uh, that has been confirmed for Greenland with observations and uh, it's confirmed for Antarctica. It's, it's actually uh, fundamental atmospheric thermodynamics. Every degree of warming, you get uh, more moisture in the atmosphere, so you get more snowfall. And that partially offsets all of this increased melting but it's not enough. Uh, that 7% uh, increase per degree of warming isn't nearly as much as the increased melting. Um, yeah, the, yeah that, I think I failed to mention the, the, the forced convection from the, uh, the water that's squirting out under the front here, it, it entrains this uh, Atlantic layer water that's below about 300 meters depth. It's four to five Celsius degrees, so it's very warm and it undercuts the, the ice sheet. It's a very similar kind of scenario as, as here. Um, now, uh, this is Greenland. So I produced this graphic for the review article and it shows Greenland getting more rainfall. Uh, that's a 33% increase in rainfall of the ice sheet over this 31 year period. And over, yeah, and uh, especially around the coast, uh, that's not surprising, these lower elevations of the ice sheet. Um, and there have been 20 uh, extreme events that where there was more than a foot or 300 millimeters of rainfall in a day. It's insane flooding. Uh, there's a, I made a video about that. You should see it if you haven't. Um, and so increased rainfall. Uh, the stars indicate the positions of long-term measurements like Iluliset here, this, this pink curve, where you have mid 20th century warming, you have sulfate dimming cooling here. And once Clean Air Act and other cleaner coal burning uh, reduced sulfur emissions from shipping uh, produces the aerosol masking effect removal and so uh, temperatures are able to rebound. So this is sulfate dimming, uh, subsequent uh, heating. And then we have the future uh, projections, Paris-like uh, scenario here and a uh, high emission scenario here uh, that leads us to several degrees, say six Celsius of temperature increase above pre-industrial by end of century. Given the ice sheets uh, viability threshold is around two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, we're, we're blowing past Greenland's tipping point. It doesn't mean that Greenland will disappear, uh, you know, mid-century or by this year. It, it the point is really the time spent above the viability threshold, and if if the climate stays above the viability threshold for, say, a hundred or two hundred years, then uh, there will be irreversibilities that are getting stronger and stronger. Um, and I think irreversibility is a, a misnomer if there were a way to cool climate back down to, say, above this two degree 
level, which where we're just on that threshold now. Um, but there's no real prospect for climate cooling, uh, barring uh, a strong um, climate engineering, but that, that would have many unintended effects. Now, the future uh, sea level projections for Greenland, you have your observations here, and then the black line is the, basically the gravity and satellite measurements. And notice how the steepness of this curve is already greater than the first part of the model projections. Uh, in my scientific view, that's because there are a number of physical processes that the models do not yet account for. And if they accounted for them, then you would have a steeper rise. Um, the more likely sea level contribution from Greenland is is up here in the future, I would say. Uh, and and if these numbers of 15, 20 centimeters don't impress you, you have to consider uh, another kind of 40 percent from thermal expansion and Antarctica's contribution, Alaska's contribution, and and lots of mountain glaciers. So the the end of century uh, sea level rise will be substantial also when you combine that with storm surge etc and then this dashed line is the sea level rise that's committed up to the year 2000 and and so as climate warms this will this sea level commitment will increase and the 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 future sea level amount from ice sheet will if the climate stayed constant it's at 2000 then the the this would eventually equilibrate um, and uh, this is the commitment these are the projections there are two different things uh, but you can see we've got a long way to go until the ice sheet equilibrates with uh, the climate that we have today um, finally um, this is the observed change in temperature and wind speed for Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, so the observed change in temperature is kind of these red colors. You can see it's warming at a certain amount. Uh, Greenland's warming more. And then the wind field is changing um, like so. So you have more south air, for example, from Greenland. It observed, that's over the past 50 years. Now, the global climate models, they don't produce as much warming nor as much of a change in the wind field and look the the average global climate model has some kind of northerly wind change when the what's observed is more southerly so this gives you an idea of once you average all the the global climate models together you get a very muted climate response that's actually what's driving the the the, the ice sheet models so Part of the underestimation of the ice sheet models is due to them being forced by a climate that isn't warming as fast as observed. So therefore, it's not so much the fault of the ice sheet models. Uh, once they account for more of the physical processes uh, accurately, they'll, they'll, they'll perform better, but they're being forced by an atmosphere that isn't uh, warming enough and the winds aren't changing enough. And that's not to say also that the ocean forcing in the global climate models is is inadequate as well so there you have it i'm out of time if you made it this far into the video you're a legend um yeah here we go